Good morning, everyone. Welcome to State College Alliance Church. It is so nice to see all those smiling eyes, if not teeth. I always try to do that now, right? When you're at the grocery store and you want to smile, you just you want to make sure they know that you're doing it. Anyway, good morning. My name's Christina Whitaker. I'm so happy to welcome you guys here. I just wanted to say three quick announcements, okay? We've heard of the family meeting next Sunday night. So we're gonna be learning about some things with the bylaws, some staffing things. Do you need to be a member to go? Let me see, no. Can anyone come to it? Are you guys all coming? Yeah, but got, snuck that one in, okay. Then two other announcements. There's a lot happening at the info table back there. There is an opportunity to find out about community groups. If you're not in one, there's a whole list. They will give you Pastor Chad's address. You can just drive over there, I think, any time of the day or night, and he'll tell you about community groups that you guys can join. Just, I don't know, ask him for a snack, whatever. And the other thing at the info table is opportunities to serve. So they've actually had some people already finding out things that they can do that match with needs that we have. In fact, my husband wanted to help with Awana with the games. They were all full. And now he is a verse listener, and he had the best time ever last week. I'm like, only 40 more weeks to go. We'll see how that, no, he really loved it. So, you know, they, you might be surprised at what they need you to do and what you can do. So that might be a huge blessing. So those things are at the info table. That's right. So the more people sign up, I think I get more points. So that will be great. <laughs> Um, so, right now, as Cheryl starts playing, we're going to just sit and prepare our hearts for our time of worship this morning. Amen. Amen. Well, as we continue to uh, prepare our hearts to come before the Lord and sing praise to Him, hear these words of uh, a call to worship from Psalm 89. 
I will sing of the Lord's unfailing love forever. Young and old will hear of your faithfulness. Your unfailing love will last forever. Your faithfulness is as enduring as the heavens. All heaven will praise your great wonders, Lord. Myriads of angels will praise you for your faithfulness. So would you join us and stand and and sing with us hymns number 139 and then 643 as we affirm the faithfulness of our beautiful Lord together. Your 
We're going to continue to sing about the faithfulness and the goodness of our Lord. Even as we navigate challenges and seasons of difficulty in our life, we can cling to the promises of our good God and turn our eyes ultimately to Jesus. So would you sing with us now hymns number 712 and then directly into number 340. ask you if you would stay standing for a moment as we pray. Father, we thank you for the, the sweetness of this moment. 
when we would turn our eyes toward you. And I sense in my spirit that there is some heart work that you desire to do in us today, and we want to be ready for that, Lord. So help us today. Holy Spirit, even as you have been preparing us through the week for the encounters that you have for us, we pray that these moments would be set aside as holy, reserving space, Lord, right now for you to move. The church and me encourage you for a moment while you wait on the Lord in prayer to simply pray a prayer of invitation. Lord, speak to my heart. Oh God, we want to hear from you. Oh God, we want more of you. Would you put your own words to that prayer as we wait on him right now? And so Jesus, as you hear the hearts of your people, we pray that uh, we right now would welcome your manifest presence over this place. What a joy to know that you are with us that you are for us, that you are shaping us and moving among us. So we invite you to do that to the degree and the measure that you desire to do today. Let nothing stand in the way of that. We ask this in the strong name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen, amen. You can go ahead and have a seat. Wonderful to be able to gather together with you. And I know that there are several, I talked to several folks um, who have been faithfully uh, attending our services online over this last several, you know, several months. And um, so while we miss having some of you here among us, uh, we're delighted for those who are able to be gathered and those who are joining us from their homes. We trust that the Lord will meet you today in a special way. Um, how many of you were with us last week when we, we were able to meet outside for the baptism, celebration, picnic, fall kickoff, whatever, however many other subtitles we gave that thing? That was really sweet. That was really great to celebrate some new life together and to see what God is doing. And uh, I think today, in some ways, is, the, is a wonderful sort of counterpart to the celebration of last week's uh, service and sermon and the, the various things that we were doing. Uh, let, me, let me give you a little bit of background on where we're going today. Sometimes uh, scripture just kind of gets your attention. You know what I'm talking about? Something just stands out to you when the Holy Spirit kind of ignites something uh, in your heart as you read. And I was on a prayer retreat last winter, many months ago now, and uh, I was simply reading in my Bible and I was in the Old Testament book of Ezra. And um, uh, our current series that we've been going through, uh, Rebuild, uh, it had not been written yet. It was sort of somewhere in the dreaming phase in my mind, and I was thinking about some things that I was hoping to preach on later in the year. But it was beginning to take shape a little bit, partly because there's just so many scriptures that address the concept of building or rebuilding, and, and this was one of them. So I'm just reading in my devotions in Ezra chapter 3, and that's actually where I'd like you to turn uh, today if you have your Bible handy with you. And I'll I'll give you just a little context um, for this. First of all, Ezra is a little bit of a difficult book to read uh, because if you're trying to understand exactly where Ezra fits into the various places, the book of Ezra actually spans a, a season of about 100 years of Israel's history. And the first six chapters of the book are, are accounts that happened long before Ezra was even born. So if you're trying to kind of do the math and figure out, oh, was he here for that? Uh, no, the things that we're going to read about today, the namesake of the book was not yet even born for, but just kind of gives you the understanding of, of what is uh, happening. Uh, so uh, after, after we get to uh, Ezra 3, uh, what we're talking about here in this beginning is, is the, the people of God having come out of exile and are now beginning rebuilding. And uh, Ezra pairs very closely with the book of Nehemiah, which also has a strong, they were contemporaries, and so has a big strong theme of rebuilding the wall. It also pairs into uh, First and Second Chronicles, uh, so we kind of get this big span of history. There is a deep well of information, but we are going to focus primarily on the rebuilding of the temple foundation after the exile's 
have returned from Babylon. So I'm going to give you three things today as we look at this passage from uh, Ezra chapter 3. The first is a fresh start. We're going to celebrate the promise that we have a God of new beginnings. Is anybody thankful for that, that we have a God who doesn't leave us kind of in our old disheveled state? But we're going to talk about that a little bit today. God of new beginnings. We're going to talk about a firm foundation, how God is our constant, even amidst a season of change. So that's one promise, two promise, and then the third is an invitation as we talk about a mix of emotion, which you'll see right away when we read this here, looking to God in joy and sadness. Uh, Today's message is the 12th and the next to last message in our series, Rebuild, Experience God's Restoration. And that continues to be our prayer. That was my prayer for you in the in the the late night in the early morning when I was awake and just just praying and spending some time with the Lord, just praying that the restoration of God would fall on this place, that the restoration of God would fall on your life in any and every area where you need to encounter him today. So read with me in Ezra chapter 3 as we take this journey into the Old Testament. It says in verse 10, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the directions of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Verse 12, But many of the priests and the Levites and the heads of their father's houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of the house being laid, though many shouted aloud for joy so that the people could not distinguish the sound of joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. May God add blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Um, I mentioned that Ezra is, is sort of an interesting book to read. One of the things that you see right off of the, right off the bat is that in the first chapter, that God puts it on the heart of a pagan king that he must help with the rebuilding uh, of the house of the God of Israel. And I just find that interesting. You know, I mean, we, we, we have all of our, our plans, you know, that generally kind of run through what the people of God are going to do to serve the Lord or whatever. But you actually find in, in, in the history of the church and the history of God's people that, you know, God sort of moves all kinds of people and all sort of interesting things sort of happen. And so this rebuilding project, and then of course if you know the story of Nehemiah and and his portion of the rebuilding, there was all kinds of help that came from the outside as well. So God provides in some some fascinating ways. But this rebuilding process is getting underway, and the people are excited about it. I I wanna just highlight again, it says, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, The priest came forward with trumpets and the Levites with their cymbals to praise the Lord. So this was probably not like somber, quiet, introspective. This was celebratory. This was loud. This was kind of making a joyful noise to the Lord. And so here these people are. They're excited because the foundation is laid. I don't know if you've ever been part of a building project, but if you've been part of our church family, you know that we've done some building here to get in the building where we're sitting, and then we did some expanding a little while ago. There's something exciting when you see progress, right? Hey, that thing we've been dreaming about is actually starting to take shape. And so it, it elicited, rightly so, this, this sense of, of God is, is doing a new thing among his people. And the people were excited. And so they, be, they begin to praise. There's, uh, there's praises that are going up. And, and I don't want to rush past that because, as you'll note, as the, as the Scripture goes on, it gets a little bit odd. I, in fact, what happened to me when I was first reading this, and I, I just hadn't remembered reading this real recently, I was reading through it, and I went like, wait a minute. And I, and I would have had to go back and I had to read it again to say, what exactly was happening here? 
I'm not going to run to that just yet because I want to start with what is happening with this praising. There's a fresh start and there is a God of new beginnings. This theme of a fresh start is one of the beautiful promises that you see interwoven all throughout scriptures. To the Corinthians, Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. To the Philippians, he says, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. There's a process that is unfolding here. We have a God of new beginnings. The psalmist said this, he said, I waited patiently for the Lord And he turned to me and he heard my cry. He lifted me up out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He put a new song of praise in my mouth. It's one of my life verses. I love that from Psalm 40. The Lamentations, we sang earlier this morning. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Church, that means before you got out of bed this morning, the new fresh mercies of God were in play for you. They were a part of your life to be received, to be walked in. What a joy. Great is your faithfulness, God. So we serve a God who who gives us a fresh start, a God of new beginnings. And that is why, as we have been going through this series over the last couple months, we've been emphasizing this notion of experiencing God's restoration in all of the places that we need the restorative work of God. And I think there's many, not just the logistical needs of the church or where we need to get volunteers serving in different ways. Those are practical symptoms of it, surely. But all of us have places where we need to experience the restoration of God. So as we've gone through some of these different things, we're asking the question, what does he want to develop? He is the great architect. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. We trust him to build his church. We trust him to rebuild his church. We trust him to build our lives. We trust him to rebuild our lives. And so we're actually seeing this. Here's what I don't want you to miss. We have a God who promises new beginnings to ancient promises. This is our good God. The faithfulness of God that is new every morning is the faithfulness of God that we celebrate from antiquity. And that is what the people are doing right here. They're they're celebrating, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever toward Israel, and the people are praising. Uh, This notion of a fresh start. So I, I was thinking about this a little bit this week. Have you ever come to a place where you've just said like, I think I just need to start over? Do you ever you have that? And we had that this week. I mean, you're just you're working on a project, and you're trying to make fixes, and you're trying to da, 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 and you're trying, and then you realize I'm I'm more scrambled now than I was two hours ago when I was try, You know what I mean? I just need to whoosh, start this thing over. And sometimes we do need to do that. Uh, a house project goes from bad to worse, and you just well, you know what? I got to go back to where we started here, and before I you know wreck the whole house and and we got to get this thing started over a discussion that becomes a a damaging argument you ever look at the people that you love and you say i think we need to start this one over you know what i mean i think we've gotten off the rails somewhere put down your rock and i'll put down my sword and we'll not try to kill each other like civilized people anymore yeah this this, that was a quote from princess bride sort of it was a badly done quote from princess bride we need to start over Um, an idea or a decision looked great on paper but never quite took shape in real life. Has that ever happened to you? And you go, this this isn't working. We thought this thing was going to work and it's it's not working. We've got to start it over. So I was thinking about some of these things. A, a, A church family goes through a couple years of upheaval as they work through a pandemic, hypothetically speaking. And there's some things we just go, we got to, we got to figure some things out all over again. We need a fresh start. But here's a promise. This is, this is a wonderful promise, is that we serve a God who actually does very well with new beginnings. And so as we lean into this promise, we actually can say, hey, you know, embracing the new work of God in my life at every phase is actually a really good thing. When Jesus comes and says, hey, Aaron, you know, 
I want to do a new thing. I want to teach you something new. I want to stretch you in a way that maybe I've been stretched. I want to ask you to take a step of faith that you haven't taken before. These are the sort of things that actually keep your faith alive and young and vibrant and, and fresh because God is inviting us to do this. I'm going to make one other just sort of observation. Do you ever notice that when we're young, life seems to be all about new beginnings, right? I mean, when you're born, like first whatever year or whatever of your life you grow like a mutant and you learn like a sponge and after the first six months or so some of you have had this experience of raising children or watching your grandchildren or maybe some of you even your great grandchildren but after the first six months of a generally very one-sided relationship little human beings start to engage with our worlds and, and new beginnings happen a lot like a lot a lot walking and talking and playing and praying and learning and developing we get to first day of school and we get to first music lesson and the first camp out new beginnings it's like there's there's a re-scripting of your life that is happening all the time when you're young you get a little bit older you hit double digits then you become a teenager uh, you hit high school you start driving you're old enough to vote you go to college or start a career, all of, like new beginnings, new beginnings, new beginnings. Think about like just how many times your life is rescripted in those young years. And then you stop being young. <laughs> and, and in some ways, life can take on a very different flavor. It, it doesn't have that sense of a new beginning around every corner. And probably for some of us, we would say, yeah, that's actually probably really good. If you continue to, to change and rescript your life at that development, at, at that pace, you know, people would leave you for six months and come back and not even know who you are because your life would be rescripted all the time. But we stop being young, we get a little bit older. And, and the one thing I notice as well is that the older we get, <clears throat> the more we tend to protect the old way that was familiar to us because it feels safe, right? Well, this is... I, I kind of have my habits now. You know what I mean? I have, my, I have my routines down, and so I sort of want to protect them. I'm not suggesting that that's bad or evil or wrong or whatever. I am suggesting, however, that for all of us who are not rescripting our life on a weekly or monthly basis, don't miss sight of the fact that we serve a God of new beginnings. Because this is actually a very wonderful promise. And there are things that I think he would love to rescript in your life and bring restoration, take you on a, a new adventure that you had not yet anticipated. New beginnings from ancient foundations. So the people of God are, are they're, they're praising. They're, they're raising up the roof. Well, the roof isn't there yet, but they're, they're on the foundation and they're excited and they're, and they're raising this roof. And now I wanna take us to our second promise that we see... <clears throat> as they're looking at a literal foundation, we see a firm foundation that God is the constant amidst the change. So they're singing, for he is good and his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. Now, it's, it's intriguing to me that we do this thing in, in the human existence where we celebrate milestones, right? We celebrate birthdays, we celebrate anniversaries, we celebrate achievements, we celebrate certain victories. The Old Testament, I, I've heard it said that the Old Testament shepherds, as they would, would lead their sheep, they would sing over their sheep, thus far the Lord has led us. Thus far, this actually, that's a beautiful picture, isn't it? The shepherd singing over his sheep, thus far the Lord has led us. We've gone through some trials, we've gone through some problems, We've got some hope and, and uncertainty in front of us, and yet thus far the Lord has led us. I've said so many times in the last years uh, in my prayer, as I'm wrestling with something or trying to make a decision or uncertain or unsure or whatever, and that phrase comes to my mind, thus far the Lord has led us. Thus far the Lord has led us. He is our constant amidst change. We said last week that there was a certain irony as we were looking at the the, the book of Judges and the account of, of Gideon, the irony is that this is the people of God in the promised land. 
I mean, they made it. I mean, that was, the, that was the theme for so much of the Old Testament is getting to the promised land, getting out of slavery and out of bondage, getting out of the wilderness and getting to the promised land. And now they're here, but they're suffering from this self-inflicted poverty because when Joshua brought them in, he said that here's kind of the, 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 the rules. He said, if, if, if you will honor and obey the Lord, this is where Joshua famously said, now for me and my house, we will... Right, he said, that's what I'm calling you to do, and to the extent that you're willing to do that, you'll walk under the protection and the blessing of the Lord, and they just struggled to do it again and again. So here they are in the promised land, but missing out on many of the promises of God. So we said at the end of last week's message that the book of Judges kind of leaves you with this deep sense that the people of God in this season, the leaders that he uses, and even the heroes like Gideon, uh, they don't give the final picture of faith and health. These were deeply flawed people. They were led by deeply flawed people who frequently turned back to the old paths of disobedience. And yet through all of that, this is the point I'm trying to make, through all of those cycles of disobedience, all of those deliverances and captivities, all of the problems, the sins, the failures, the wins, God was the constant. Think of the changes that his people had seen from bondage to freedom from freedom to wandering from wandering to the promised land from victory to civil war to disobedience to captivity and now back to a fresh start a new beginning with God who has been their constant God will do his purposes God will be present when all of us are done and gone and God's purposes will prevail. Uh, Alexander McLaren said this, and I think this might be helpful for some of us here today because as we think th- through our series of changes, yeah, maybe they haven't been quite as severe as some of the things that I have listed, but there is no question our lives have felt very disrupted, very confusing at times. Andrew McLaren says this, peace comes not from the absence of trouble, but from the presence of God. So in the midst of our trials, in the midst of our challenge, in the midst of our uncertainty, we look to him to be our constant. That's promise number two. Now I want to get you to the the third point here, which is actually an invitation. Uh, Verse 12 says, Many of the priests and the Levites and the heads of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first house, they wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid. Though many shouted aloud for joy. So the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout. So this is the passage that gripped me when I was first reading this. This was the verses that sort of stood out to me and made me go like, wait, wait, what were they doing? Were they weeping or were they celebrating i thought they were celebrating but now it sounds like some of the people and the answer is yes the people were praising the lord and they're lifting up the faithfulness of god and thanking him for his constant thanking him for a fresh start and at the same time some of the older people who remembered what god had done in the past and were looking at what god was doing and they were weeping over the current reality even as others were celebrating and this picture was just gripping to me because the rejoicing makes sense. The people of God are celebrating his faithfulness. And the weeping, well, this makes sense too. It makes sense too. People were looking at a new thing, but gripped with the challenge of this is not what it was, it is something different. And the Spirit of God spoke to my heart in that moment and said, there is something for you in this. And there's something for the people that you love in your church. That we are simultaneously rejoicing over the faithfulness of God and lamenting the things that we are lacking or have lost. It's actually not a bad picture of what that tension looks like when we build on the faithfulness of God and his new mercies and his ancient promises. 
So a couple of things that stood out to me as I was looking at this. Number one, I note that there was not a value assigned to the joyful people or to the weeping. Like, I, I think if I would write this, especially in my, whatever, from my perspective, I would probably say the good guys were happy and they were excited about a new thing of God and then these people over here, they just couldn't get it. And they just, they're, they're here crying when they should have been excited. But that's not what it says. Now some of you are a little more cynical. You would say, well, I would have scripted it the other way. There's way too much joy in life. You know what I mean? These people are rightly lamenting a loss over here, and these idiots are making a bunch of noise and distracting with all these things, and they should have figured out that actually this was a time of weeping, not of dancing. But it doesn't say that either. It just, and maybe this is what sort of threw me off as I was reading through it, is that it, it just kind of states it. Some of the people were celebrating in a loud voice, and some of the people were weeping in a loud voice, and the two were intermingled such that you actually couldn't really tell who was doing what. So there wasn't a value assigned to the joyful or to the weeping. Both were valid. There was also not a clear distinction between the joy and the sadness. And maybe that's another good word for us. I mean, I don't know about you, and again, I'm, I'm being vulnerable here, so just, just at least nod, give me a little something here. I don't know about you, but there are times that, like, I don't really know what my own heart is doing. You know what I mean? I'm kind of hopeful and optimistic and discouraged and scared and wanting to be faithful and wanting to run and wanting to go to the battle lines and fight and wanting a break all at the same time. Has anybody been there? There's not a real clear distinction with some of the emotional response. Now, I'm not advocating for a total lack of stability in your emotional life. I'm not hoping for that. I'm simply asking us to acknowledge that sometimes our hearts are complex. And oftentimes, the answers are not just simple. I'm going to give you a 30-minute sermon, fix all your problems for the week. Come back next week, we'll do it again. It's like God gives us some space. I think there's an invitation here. There's some space to simply say, yeah, some of this stuff is hard. I imagine that there were people who were weeping at the sight of the new foundation thinking, well, I don't, I don't want to not have the new foundation. That's good. That's a good sign. That's progress. God's working. That, that's a good thing. But there's a part of my heart that's grieving something that is no longer here. And there were probably some other people that were celebrating and saying, man, God is so good. This is so awesome. I'm not sure if I fully understand what someone else is wrestling with. So it's complex. So I think that there's an important invitation here. And I think in this process of rebuilding, what I would like to simply kind of wrap up with is this. You know, if grief is a real part of life that we don't have to ignore. I mean, that's, that's kind of what I see as I read Scripture and I read it honestly and kind of in real time. Is it that grief is a real part of life that I don't have to ignore. And if Scripture gives us permission to be real with our grief instead of overly stoic, you know what I mean? I, I really do think what I was saying that before about not placing values, I think that part of what we do especially in our culture, people who are in a culture like mine, is that we, we kind of place this value on the, the stiff upper lip. You know, so as long as we would say like, you know, I'm holding it together. As long as I can give the appearance of having it held together, then you know, we'll all feel comfortable. But I think sometimes it's just, it's just good to say, Lord, here's what I'm feeling. Here's where my anxious heart is wrestling. Here's where I am weeping over things that I miss or I lost or I've, I've felt a sense of loss over. Like to actually have scriptural permission to be honest in those things. So if grief is a real part of life, we don't have to ignore. And if scripture gives us permission to be real with our grief, is it possible that God actually wants to meet us 
in our places of celebration and our places of grief. Like, is it possible that God is saying, like, that's actually an open door of invitation for you to be real? And again, I'm not going to say, okay, let's all, let's all kind of air all of our griefs right now. Everybody stand up, start crying, come on. Let's, let's, I'm not going to do that. But to say, if that invitation is there, that invitation is there. That God meets us in our celebration. I think we, we tend to do that well. I tend to do that well. But God also meets us in our grief. I'm going to give you a quote from Frederick Buechner. He said, It is not the objective proof of God's existence that we want, but the experience of God's presence. And that's why we've been talking about this so much. He's saying, yeah, I know you've been, a, you've been stuck on this. I have. That is the miracle we are really after. And that is also, I think, the miracle we really get. It is an invitation to his presence. So here I am, last winter, reading Ezra. You know how you do. And, and I, I really felt like the Lord met me with that. said, when the time is right, and as you begin to rebuild, make sure that people know to meet me in my places, in your places of celebration, but to look for me in the places of grief as well. I think he wants to meet us there. So I would like to allow the Holy Spirit to unpack that in your heart, in your life, in your family, in your circles, in all the ways that he wants to do in these coming weeks. I'm going to pray for you. Worship team's going to lead us. We're not going to have a public grief sharing. But if we need to cry, we're going to cry. And when we need to celebrate, we're going to celebrate. Jesus, we love you today. And... Um, I just sense, Holy Spirit, that you, you've got something for us, and it's in a place that we, we don't always have a real strong sort of command or sense of even understanding in our own hearts. And so I pray, Lord, that you would give enlightenment, that you would illuminate the places in our heart where you desire to work today. So Father, it might be as simple as saying that we would acknowledge before you the things that we are missing. There are, there are people's faces in our church family that I haven't seen for a long time, and I miss them. There are, there are certain things that are uncertain in our world, and, and so it, it causes a sense of, of not knowing. There are certain routines that don't feel normal, and, and we may miss those as well. So Lord, I, I just pray that you would help us by your Holy Spirit to cause us uh, to be honest and to be real and to be genuine with you. So that as we rebuild, we, we wouldn't simply say, well, we're getting all the pieces back together, and that's good. We're getting teams filled up. We're getting things set up in place. We're getting plans that are made. All of those are good things. Lord, we desire those things to happen. But Lord, I pray that we would be real about the condition of our own hearts. And that even this week, when we, when we pray, when we talk to you, when we engage with others, that you would give us those spaces that we can say, Lord, here's where I'm feeling pretty raw. Here's where I'm hurting. Here's where I'm wrestling. And, and here's the beauty, church. This, this, is not, this is not wallowing. This is not, I'm just going to complain. This is actually a step to say, and now, <laughs> Lord, I'm inviting your restoration into that place. Not just a theory, not just a good idea. Lord, I'm inviting that your restoration into that place. So I pray that you would help us with that Holy Spirit in the ways that only you can do. Cause us to be responsive to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Could we stand together?
Could we meet the Lord in worship? And whatever comes out of you today, whether it's joyful noises, if somebody brought a trumpet and a cymbal and you want to go to town, go for it. It might mess you guys up up there. It would be scriptural, though. You could defend it. Or if tears come out when you're worshiping, I think the Lord meets us in both of those places today. God bless you. As we, uh, as we prepare to close the service, we're going to sing one final song, hymn number 705, It Is Well With My Soul. And um, every time we've done a survey uh, of the church family and asked for their, their favorite hymns, you know, ask you folks to tell us, what's your favorite? This one gets more votes than, than any, um, every time we've asked. And I think it's because the message of this hymn resonates with what we just heard from Pastor Aaron, that we need not pretend, in fact, that there are not times when sorrows like sea billows roll, um, but in those moments, through the presence of Christ, it can be well with our soul. And so in that spirit, I would invite you to sing along with us. We'll sing all four verses of hymn number 705. It is well with my soul.
Church, I just want to remind you that if you want some prayer, there's going to be some prayer team members up here at the front. So come on for prayer. And if you're watching us online, there's a request button also that you can fill out. Um, I want to leave you with a benediction. Pastor Aaron um, spoke just such a word from the Lord this morning, I feel, um, with the Second Corinthians 17 that he had mentioned. And I want to read this to you from God's word. And it's true. And it has a challenge after its blessing. Okay? Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. God bless you this week.